Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore all things cinema. I want to welcome to my show Kelsey James, who is a writer. She is a historical fiction author and content marketer whose work has appeared in Condé, Condé Nast Traveler, Insider, ABC News, and the Huff Huffington Post, among other outlets. A graduate of Dartmouth College with a degree in creative writing and classical studies, she currently lives with her family outside of New York City, and we are discussing her new book today, which I have today here, The Woman in the Costello. Kelsey, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I love this cover, by the way. That's like, <laughs> that's just so 60s Italian. You know, I, I love it. It's so, so good. Uh, before we jump into discussing the book, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the film Black Sunday, which I know was an inspiration uh, on the book. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen uh, Black Sunday, or if you haven't seen it in a while, I'll just read a little synopsis. In 1630, as a woman is executed for being a witch, she places a curse on those who condemned her. 200 years later, she returns from her grave and begins a bloody campaign to possess the body of her beautiful lookalike descendant. Now only the girl's brother and a handsome doctor stand in her way. Okay, so let me ask you first, Kelsey, do you remember the first time you saw Black Sunday? Yes, I actually watched it deliberately as research for my book. The story was already sort of taking shape. And so I was sort of diving into classic Giallo films. And Black Sunday is kind of considered pioneering. It really was like the first Italian Giallo film. It set the standard for all the ones to come. Um, so it definitely made an impression on me. Um, you know, it really combines um, just like gore with like beautifully shot cinematography. And, um, you mm -hmm. know, I think that was somewhat new for the time and, and somewhat exciting um, for the, the film world to see. Yeah, I agree. And I hadn't seen it before. And, you know, so many of the images are shocking i mean even for today's standards like mm -hmm. right at the beginning the nailing of the mask of satan on her face yes. with the with the spikes inside and then you see like this gush of blood uh pop out of the mask i was like oh my god how i mean it was banned in the uk for a number yeah. of years yeah. uh it's really got some you know striking images and and this you know the special effects were I mean I know you know I know you you said this a little bit in your blog you know maybe some things would stand out as cheesy today but uh you know for example when, when we see the, when we see the bat come in and the one of the doctors is like fighting the bat like it 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 looks a little obvious that there, that's an effect there uh but some of them are incredible like when her father after he dies and then dies again and then he's when they set him on fire and you just see his face uh, burning. I mean, they literally show that. Uh, and then particularly as they remove her mask uh, in the coffin and the bugs coming out of her eyes and all the holes in her face. I mean, it's quite incredible what yeah. they they did there. You know, yeah. I mean, some of those effects are astounding, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really an interesting example, too, Um of, you know, these films, kind of the differences of how they were re released for different markets. So like one thing that I found really interesting, um, you know, about Italian cinema um, is that they didn't record the sound um, right, when they right. were shooting movies. They did all the dubbing later. And so a lot of these movies were released in multiple languages and the lips like never really matched up for anyone <laughs> like because they were yes. doing it. And so and Black Sunday is really interesting because the, the star, Barbara Steele, um, is British. And I think that's like, right. a, a, you know, a lot of these movies had these very international casts and crews. And, um, and in my book, that's certainly the case. It's a young Italian American starlet, um, who gets cast in this, you know, Italian giallo horror movie. And, um, like Barbara Steele, it's sort of her opportunity to become a star and Black Sunday mm. was a star maker for Barbara Steele. That's like really what, what catapulted her, um, mm -hmm. in, to becoming a movie star in Italy. Um, but yes, the effects are definitely um, definitely gory and they had to cut a lot of those out, I think for, you know, depending where the release releases were um, because the Hayes Code was still very much in effect in, in right. this time. 
Right. Yeah. I just, yeah. Cause I, now I was trying to find the Italian version and I couldn't find it. So I was, I only could see, find the English dubbed version. I don't, did you see both versions? You know, no, I, th I, I think I saw the English dubbed one as well. It's been a little bit since I watched the whole movie, but um, yeah, I mean, I just know that they had to adapt things um, for, for each market. And that's something that's referenced in my book as well. Um, the like, you know, bombshell um, co-star um, who's a little bit of a Sophia Loren influence, like talks about like if her breasts make it past the censors. <laughs> and so there's stuff like that <laughs> that, that um, you know, are, are mentioned there. Um, and that first scene that you mentioned with the, the mask being nailed in, which I think is just like probably the most powerful like scene of the movie in a lot of ways and really sets the stage oh, yeah. um, for yeah. what's to come. Um, I actually mentioned that scene specifically in my book as well. It's like inspiration. Yes. So my book, there's like a film being um, filmed within the story of the novel. And right. that the movie that's being filmed is in, is really similar to Black Sunday. And, um, and that opening shot is referenced by the filmmakers in my book as like inspiration for their opening shot, just because it's it's such a memorable one. Right, because there's there's a scene where I, I believe they're bringing the lead actor to see the film so she can see yeah. some of the inspiration for this film. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really I really enjoyed that. And yeah, because I, I just found online the Italian version was a couple of minutes longer. Mm. You can you can get the arrow video uh, arrow video released uh, Blu-ray. So. Yeah, because the European is, version was called The Mask of Satan, and it's 87 yeah. minutes, and the score was also different uh, by Roberto Nicolosi, and then the AIP re in America re-edited it, and they cut out a couple of two minutes, and the score was by Le Les Baxter. Uh, so I would love to see the Italian version, because, yeah, that, that was the one thing, because I, I thought that you know Barbara Steele was so great and it was a shame because the English dubbing is not it doesn't it doesn't really match the emotion of what she was doing and the other actors as well so that was uh that's a bit of a letdown but it's still so enjoyable I don't know if how you if the dubbing distracts for you at all yeah I mean I think yes a little bit but I do think but what you're saying about Barbara Steele like her expressions are just I mean you know yeah. I understand why this made her a star like she really um was terrific um and i and i think definitely was one of the inspirations for my main character sylvia in that way who's described as being very expressive um right. i also had read that you know barbara Steele caused a little bit of drama on set so. I, yes i read that yeah <laughs> So, um, you know, that's always fun. I think definitely, you know, a lot of these movies, as I was researching, it seemed like, you know, these kind of like a lot of these low budget giallos, there was always a lot of drama. And, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that certainly was the case um, in my book as well. Yeah, well, that that that's such a, you know, it's such a perfect inspiration for a novel, because you're right, these stories are really interesting. And, um, you know, like you said, this person coming from another country to make this movie in Italy. And yeah, I mean, she she apparently years later admitted that she was, you know, difficult. It's a it's a great story and setting and inspiration for for your book. Um, you know, it's interesting because it's this this movie is like this, you know, satanic vampire story. Uh, do, do you see it as like a very kind of simple good versus evil plot or is there something more to it to you? Yeah, I mean, I think horror is always a way of processing societal fears. Um, and so mm -hmm. the way that I kind of spun it in my book and I and I feel like perhaps you know some of this was there in the original too although you know I I I, I can't speak for the filmmakers but in my book it was really about um you know the witch was trying to really almost seduce her beautiful ancestor into like um allowing her to like possess her and like let her back in and I think um it was sort of the witch the way I described her was like representing, you know, carnal desire and sexuality. And this, the sixties was a time period when people were becoming very afraid of like the empowered sexual woman and the destruction mm -hmm. of the nuclear family. Um, and those are, are definitely themes in my book. And I actually 
deliberately made the protagonist um, in direct contrast to that. She's an unwed single mother. So she's kind of, she is that societal fear. And so, and right. she's, and she's starring in this movie that's all about, you know, having a, the, the witch resisted and a, and a white wedding at the end that's tied up with the bow. And she, she doesn't like that because that's, that's, you know, feels in conflict with, with her own view of things. And so I really mm -hmm. like that tension there. Yeah, I agree. Cause that, that to me was some of the most interesting things about this story was these fears because they, you know, they sentenced these two people to, because they were practicing witchcraft and they, they, um, uh, they were Satan worshipers and, and they get burnt at the stake. And then as this storm comes down to, to stop the fire, that scares everybody so much that they run, that they then just bury them, that they uh, put the crucifix on the the, the coffin and a and a and a, uh, a window <laughs> over the head, so that if they were to come alive and come back from the dead, the crucifix would stop them. And I found that so interesting because you would, you know, on the what you would think that in these two hundred years that someone would eventually said you know what, let's just burn, go back and finish the job. Yeah. But I was so fascinated because they are so afraid, like 200 years later, because they're afraid of inviting those evil spirits back, just like when the rain started. And yeah. even the paintings in the castle, because they are the descendants uh, the um, of um, the people who live in the castle now. And it's the paintings of these two witches and they never took the paintings down you know and it's so interesting to me well it's it's not exactly clear if if it's those people in the paintings as i know other people they all i mean barbara Steele look like the witch like exactly right. yeah. um so i believe it's them but i i thought it was interesting that those paintings were never taken down it's mm -hmm. this fear to touch touch anything to go and look at that crypt and it's mm -hmm. almost like this generational um almost you know trauma or of this experience mm -hmm. that's just been like passed down because the father at the anniversary 200 years later he's looking at the fire and he, as the pic you know beautifully shot as the camera is behind his head and goes around to his face and he's just staring down at that fire and he knows it's this, this superstition of the this 200 an anniversary a uh, hundred years before on the hundredth anniversary, there was this earthquake. So I'm, and they're they live right beside this tomb, which and they just do not want to touch it. They won't want to look at it. And that to me was really, really appealing. I don't know if those were some certain elements of their characters that stood out to you. Yeah, no, I mean it definitely it is interesting, like why they didn't that you know they're so afraid of the past and the past yeah. coming back and like not wanting to touch it and. Um, I think in 1960 Italy, you know, this was still like, I don't, I don't think this is probably like directly a part of it, but it, it maybe subconsciously was there. Like this isn't long after world war two and people right. are still, um, coming out of this trauma. And I think like these past experiences might've kind of hovered over them in a similar way where it's like, we are trying to move forward. We don't want to go back there. Like the country Italy is booming with American tourism and yet right. there's still these scars that linger. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. Yeah. I, that, that was something that really appealed to me and Barbara Steele's character, not as the witch, but as the young woman, um, when she's talking to the doctor, you know, we have this love story blooming with one of the, one of the young doctors. And she even says that her life is just sadness and grief. And, you know, as she stares at the tomb and it's just, I mean, at the same time, you know, if we, if we lean into the uh, supernatural elements of like this haunting, like as the witch says, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, she's cursed the family. She's going to come back for revenge. And so she'll like run through their bloodlines, you know, yeah. <laughs> which again, it's just this, this, it's almost like these evil spirits are what's causing so much of these grief. It's like, they can't, they can't, they don't quite have the power to come back for revenge yet, but they're lingering until, of course, here with uh, the, that drop of blood that hits mm. the body from uh, the doctor yeah. by accident. And then we go from there. But, you know, what's what's interesting is that really it's like this story of like 
good triumph triumphing over evil or or facing your fears going into the fear which is very common in in uh, horror the horror genre like something like even nightmare on elm street is uh that element of just facing the um you know the the the, the evil that is haunting you but in this case what i found compelling is that they don't decide for that they are basically forced to face the evil because mm -hmm. they're being attacked uh yeah. and and so these things are forced on them because they don't have a choice otherwise i don't think because they were so crippled by fear i don't i don't really know if if they would have ever done it just voluntarily i don't know if that right. was anything that that you had any thoughts on yeah um i mean the i i think again like to to bring you know world war ii back how you're saying like these um the the seeking revenge and like these hauntings like I, the i think what's really interesting is the country was thrust into this and this was also a country that changed sides during the war and so yes, you had yes. families torn apart neighbors torn apart um and you know just so i think like that kind of comes to mind for me a little bit of just like the echoes of like people wanting vengeance on each other and the town you know that my my book um has as the main setting on um, Castello del Lago it talks about how it's like seems like this quiet sleepy town but there's really this violence lurking underneath right. and there's people there right. that still, um you know are getting into fist fights with each other and that was um actually like a real detail like great thing about writing about the 60s you can talk to real people <laughs> that remember it um and right. like I had a friend a family friend who had um grown up in Rome and lived there during the 60s and remembered fist fights and political brawls being like so common um just mm. on the on the streets and that's so that detail came into my book and so i think you know it, it really is a time period where um there there were still these um you know people being thrust into these these uh situations and that and that sort of inspired um you know the my book is about um you know this young american starlet who's cast in a horror movie that, you know, starts to seem too real. You get to kind of blur reality and fantasy. Um, but her aunt who had um, starred in a Mussolini propaganda film and her mother had this falling out during the war. And it's like, what does it look like when they're forced to come back together um, mm. decades, decades later and confront these, these past traumas and these, you know, this past hat hatred. Right, um, right. So, and I think like you can kind of see that, um, you know, in the plot of Black Sunday a little bit with like, you know, being forced to like confront right. this evil. Um, so I think that's, you know, possibly something that was that was a theme that was reflected. So when you decided to write the book, had you seen Black Sunday and and then because it's interesting, this connection is so strong. Yeah. Uh, or or when when did it when did it form uh, the the connection between the film and the book? I, you know, I'm trying to remember. And it's always hard for writers to explain exactly how the puzzle pieces all came. You no, know, yeah, because it's so. I imagine it's. I imagine it's. It is somewhat uh, instinctive, right? It's an impulse that can't always be described. But I, but I definitely had. I think the general idea before I watched the movie. Like I remember seeking out. The movies like to kind of learn more like it wasn't like one that I had happened to see and then it like led led to the book like I did I specifically was like looking to kind of learn about Italian giallo I would say like my a lot of my my personal like classic movie watching like I was a Hitchcock fan and like a lot of the more like oh, me too um, like American um uh mo movies that I was familiar, familiar with I wasn't as uh, familiar with Italian cinema so um it was definitely um, a good education to kind of delve into that a little bit. Well, it's it's interesting because you know Jallo, um, you know, just because because I've I, I I don't know a lot about Jallo, and just when you Google Jallo, um, people often describe it as as more of like things about like serial killers and and things like that. Would 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 this be considered? Because I know you had said this was considered the first Jallo. Um, would this be more horror or would it be ja uh, Jallo? Because yeah, yeah everyone has everyone has a right. different opinion about what the first Jallo was. I was curious yeah. what you thought. Yeah, I mean that's true. I think Jallos are kind of also more like thrillery a lot of time, and this is right. definitely a horror movie. Um, so no, I I think this is more horror, but I do think it's still there. There was a lot of the blueprint that was still laid. I think for these later movies, um, just in, right. in terms of like how 
sort of the, the you know, some of these like graphic elements, yeah. you know, even if they weren't always horror elements in Giallo films, I think, you know, this still like graphic contrast with, um, you know, the cinematography and the things that are like kind of more beautiful. Yeah, I definitely think Black Sunday is a horror movie, but I think um, it definitely inspired, I think, certain elements of the the kind of more thriller Giallo films. I think you're right. It certainly has it's laying the groundwork for for what to come and and certainly the gothic core like when i when i look at this i you know you think of like you know you mentioned Hitch, hitchcock something like rebecca uh mm. you know this or or really i mean to me like that that gothic uh stories gothic tales or or gothic horror almost had like a film noir feel like the german expressionism here you have like very dark use of shadow and light um the art direction those castles uh are incredible but they have a real lonely isolated fearful you know in these big spaces are there's something very terrifying about that and the effects like we mentioned particularly at the end i thought it was really interesting as the witch is trying to morph into uh barbara Steele. the other barbara character barbara Steele plays aza i believe um uh, mm -hmm. and you know, it. I, I thought, what an interesting way to like do the effect with just these like black lines forming on both of their face, um, mm. almost like they're just becoming old all of a sudden. I just thought that was such an unusual, interesting choice. You know, really, really, wow, it's amazing what they did back then. Um, yeah. Was there was there any other uh, just moments that stood out to you in the film uh, as be being particularly striking that perhaps we didn't mention? Um. No, I mean, I think that the ones you mentioned with like the bugs and the mask, like I think all those like really like shocking, gory ones are the ones that really like stuck in my mind. And I think, you know, the castle too, like you were mentioning, I think that was a big thing I latched onto with some of these um, movies shot in the time period is like that they were a lot of them shot on location in these real castles um, right. outside outside of Rome, like um, Black Sunday was shot um you know, a, a lot, some partly in studio and partly in a castle in Arsali, um, which I actually mentioned in my book, like some of the um, scouting locations of other castles that where I knew like real movies had been filmed. And, um, and it was just really appealing to have this idea of like a, you know, locked room mystery, where you have a cast and crew, like trapped in mm -hmm. a Italian castle. I mean, what, what's more fun than that? So, um, right. yeah, this, the setting, I think definitely, um was was very evocative for me well you know it's interesting because you you mentioned some things about world war ii and the the influence of mussolini on it italian cinema i know comes up on a number of occasions uh yeah. in your novel so w why is that important for a novel that takes place in 1965 italy more than two decades after the the death of mussolini like wh why, why was that an important element for you yeah, so it was definitely relevant for the plot and also just for Italian cinema. Um, you know, he really revived the Italian film industry with the right. you know, he Cinecetta Studios and the lead up to World War II. Um, and the the protagonist's aunt, Gabriella, um, was this film star in Mussolini propaganda films. Um, and so that's just like a very relevant plot point because um, she's estranged from the protagonist's mother. And so we're really seeing, um, you know, how it came to life to have them on different sides of the war and reuniting years later. Um, and the the movie that it mentions um, is fictional that, that Gabriella starred in, Giovanni of the Black Bands. But a lot of Mussolini propaganda had this idea of, um, you know, showing Italy's greatness. And so like Scipio Africanus is like a a real um, example of kind of Mussolini propaganda where it's like just showing these past figures who right. were military heroes that were meant to sort of remind the Italian people of like Mussolini's own greatness and Italy's own greatness. Um, so, you know, I, I think that um, it, it was just relevant to kind of lay the groundwork of like what, what had come before and, um, and also to provide a contrast um, to Sylvia who, um, is is a movie star is becoming a movie star um you know 20 years later um but gabriella um was pursuing fame at the cost of her family you know she had to really um be, you know abandon her family whereas sylvia um is starring in this movie in order to support 
her daughter. Like this is her only shot at real money. And so it shows how um, their pursuit of fame, you know, they had very different motivations. Um, but in the end, we see that, um, I think, you know, we see that, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but, um, we, you know, I think that we, we can see Spoiler that. alert. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that like, ultimately like the three, you know, Sylvia, her mother and her aunt do care deeply about her family and uh, about their family and will do really anything for them. And I think that's something mm. that ultimately unites them. I, and I know you, you already answered this, but um, I imagine Barbara Steele was an inspiration for the main character, Sylvia. I mean, I love this little because I got this little poster, the fictional uh, film in uh, in the book, Revenge of the uh, of the Lake Witch. I mean, that's very Barbara Steele to me. It was is that accurate that she was uh, at least visual, at least the the uh, the way she looked? Yeah, so definitely, I think a few people like Sylvia is definitely, you know, like not directly inspired by one person. Barbara Steele is definitely one of them. Um, I right. for sure. And then um, I, she's described in the book as kind of having a Natalie Wood look as well. Um, and then like not in terms of looks, but I just think like an interesting um, another interesting example is actually Carrie Fisher. Um, which, you know, obviously was later, you know, when she filmed the Star Wars movies, but she was 19 when she, like, yeah. On, yeah, you know, I know, and I think like people don't always realize just how young a lot right. of these actresses are. And so the protagonist in my book is very young as well. She's 20. And I think, um, you know, that led to situations where they, they were a little bit naive and taken advantage of and, um, you know, there's some not nice guys on the set in my book that, um, you know, she has has conflict with that. I think that was very um, inspired by reality. Um, you know, Carrie Fisher's mother, Debbie Reynolds, actually, like, famously talked about how on Singing in the Rain, um, Gene Kelly bullied her like he was really mm. mean to her. And I think that right. dynamic um, inspired the dynamic between um, Sylvia and her male co-star Terrence Leopold a little bit. Was there a, I believe there was a film uh, in not long after Black Sunday was made where the cast and crew had to also stay in the castle they were filming. What, yes. what What's that movie? Is that also Bava? Um, it was Castle of the Living Dead. And that, that, um, that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was filmed over like four or five weeks in a castle outside of Rome. Um and and I that was where I was like, and I think it was almost entirely, if not entirely on location. And so that was one where I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, I can like I can use that <laughs> for my book. That's really interesting. And another one where it seems like there was drama on set and um and, you know, like some of the credits of like who actually directed it. It's like not totally clear. So like some of those things were like mm. useful, useful inspiration as well. Yeah, it's really juicy stuff. And I, I'm just curious, like what what was the research process like for to craft yeah. for to make this accurate depiction of being on set in a yeah. 60s alley? What what how did you go about trying yeah. to make it as accurate as you could? Yeah, that's it's a great question. And I I'll also I'll like back up a little bit to say um, you know, one of my majors in college, as you mentioned, was classical studies. Um, and so I spent, you know, all this time going to archaeological sites in Italy, Greece, and Turkey, and you're literally oh, wow. analyzing like shards of pottery. Like you have like such little information to go off of compared to like when you research a more modern time period like the 60s, that it was such a treat. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I get to watch movies as part of my research. This is fun. <laughs> like that's not the case yeah. for ancient for ancient Rome. <laughs> um, so um, but I was, um, there were a few books that were um, particularly helpful. Um, I would say the, one of the most helpful was My Life with Cleopatra, um, which is what oh, I wanted yeah. to the producer <laughs> I know that one. Of the, yeah, uh, was one of the producers of the film. And it was all about, you know, the making of Cleopatra, which is one of the most expensive, you know, the most expensive movie production that had ever happened at that time. Mm. Um, and it was filmed in the early 1960s in Italy. And it was the genesis of paparazzi culture and just all of these really juicy things. Um, but it also like kind of casually talked about some of these scars from World War II that still lingered. Like I remember there was a beach they paid this fortune to film on and it turned out they had to clear it of mines that were still there that were placed oh, wow. there for the allied invasion. And actually like a few people died. Like it was, you know, like huh. it, 
Yeah. So there it's like you're seeing Italy like moving forward with like the Hollywood on the Tiber era and like booming tourism. And yet you still have these like very physical reminders of what happened there. Um, mm. So there, there were really great details in that book. Um, and, and I think the genesis of paparazzi culture, obviously if Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton um, was a lot of fun to read about and just like how they had to deal with that. And um, there are small elements of that um, in, in the book as well. And um, I also think like the genesis of this period where people having this idea that, you know, stars don't deserve secrets and it's a book where everyone's trying to keep secrets. So it's just um, was right. kind of um so that was one of the books um the girl on the balcony um uh was by uh was another one um talking about you know the star from Romeo and Juliet Olivia Hussey um, oh yes yes <laughs> um and she um like her audition for that film she talks about like the director like flicking little paper balls at her head to get a rise out of her um and I that was the detail I kind of adapted for the book um that I mentioned for Lucrezia's audition just because the director in my story is um a little bit of a is a little bit childlike and, and a little bit of a bully so that was right. um so yeah so those were some helpful details I I've been to Italy you know multiple times um and then also a, a, since we're talking about movies here um two weeks in another town um, which is the same move, filmmaking team that did the bad and the beautiful um, was a really oh, right. Great, yeah, it was a really great. That's um, Kirk Douglas too, right? I think that's Kirk Douglas. Yeah, yeah, um, I've seen that. Right. Yeah, and so, but it shows it's the plot of it is all about making a movie in Italy in the 1960s, right. and so I was just like studying it for so many and it was made you know in the right time period so I was just like what equipment are you they using like all you know all these little details I was trying to glean from it um so that was a fun one to watch as well who um if 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 this ever gets made into a film which would Ooh. be which would be fascinating <laughs> uh, I think who who could play Sylvia for you who's the ideal uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, so wait let me look up the, the I'm gonna blank on the name let me look up um who there was an actress I saw recently that I was like, oh, she would be great. Um, Rose Williams, who starred in Sanditon, I could see being Sylvia, or um, maybe let me just look up the other. I'm a terrible memory. Oh yeah. Um, or um, find her name. Hang on. Oh, Anna De Armas, I could see as well. Oh yes, yes, that would be a great choice, actually. Yeah, I would. Well. Speak it into the universe when <laughs> yeah. see it happen. <laughs> well, it's certainly it's certainly uh, a really compelling story. So I think it would be it would be great as a a, a film uh, or you know nowadays um, you know these mini series or TV series are are really popular as well. Uh, I just lastly just going back a little bit, what what got you interested in becoming a writer in general? And that's a fun question. I mean, it's sort of something I've always wanted to do since childhood. I feel like it's it's a, an easy answer, but you'll hear that from a lot of authors that you just kind of, it's something I've just like always, always wanted to do. I wrote my first novel when I was 12. So oh. um, yeah, <laughs> so I've been um, working toward this for a long time. Um, I studied creative writing in college, as you mentioned. And um, yeah, I mean, I've just always loved writing and reading and, um, you know, it takes, it takes a long time to kind of get your foot in the door in this industry. So um, it was very exciting to get to have this be my debut about, um, you know, a, a really fun topic in a, in a place that's very near and dear to my heart. And and I understand you have another book in the works coming out about uh, Gaslight, I believe. Yes. So I have Secrets of Rosebriar Hall is coming out um, in June 2024. Um, it tells it's set on 1908 um, Gold Coast, Long Island. And it's about a woman who um, hosts an elaborate dinner party and wakes up and can't remember anything that happened. Um, mm. And she has to find out um, something terrible happened. She doesn't know what. And she has to find out. Um, before she may find herself in very real danger. And it's an homage to Gaslight, um, which ah. is the, the 80th anniversary of the movie um, next year. So it's great timing for, for my book to come out. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to that. And again, the book is called The Woman in the Costello, and it's out now. Where's the best place for people to get a copy? 
So anywhere books are sold, wherever you like to buy books is great with me. <laughs> great. Fantastic. And if people want to follow you on social media or check out your website, where's the best place for them to go? Yeah. So on Instagram, I'm Kelsey James author on TikTok. I'm Kelsey writer. Um, and then my website is KelseyJamesAuthor.com. Great. Then, so I will leave the links in the description box below for where you can uh, follow Kelsey online and and get her book. It's Christmas is around the corner. So uh, for any Italian uh, horror fans, they'll certainly eat up uh, the woman in the Costello. So Kelsey, thanks again so much for your time. Uh, I really you appreciate so you coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is exclusive content that I create month in and month out. And as a subscriber, you are able to vote on polls and contribute to what I do on Patreon month in and month out. So head over to the link for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel by pressing the thanks link, which you will find directly below the video frame. Just click on the thanks link and you can leave a donation there if you choose to. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing. It is absolutely free to do so. By pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo, you will see it floating above my head in the top left corner. To your top left in just a second, just click on that and then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes also click the like button and leave a comment below let me know what you think of this episode also you can also share the episode all of these things are what produce traction uh to my youtube channel so i appreciate you watching and thank you again and i will see you in the next episode